Germany is coming under increasing pressure to donate its Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine. Or, at least, to authorise allied countries to provide Kyiv with the German-made Leopards from their own stocks. Now, the issue is set to dominate the latest meeting of the Ukraine Defence Contact Group, which is underway right now at the US Air Base in Rammstein, Western Germany. Now, US Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin is hosting counterparts and senior military officers from countries supporting Ukraine's fight against Russia. In his opening remarks, the US Defence Secretary said that Western allies need to dig deeper to support Ukraine with military aid. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a crucial moment. Russia is regrouping, recruiting and trying to re-equip. This is not a moment to slow down. It's a time to dig deeper. The Ukrainian people are watching us. The Kremlin is watching us, and history is watching us. So we won't let up, and we won't waver in our determination to help Ukraine defend itself from Russia's imperial aggression. Now, addressing the Rammstein meeting via video link, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, urged his allies to speed up weapons supplies. Now, there is much agreement among the defence ministers and military commanders meeting on the US airbase, but the question of main battle tanks remains a major sticking point. Earlier this month, France agreed to send light-armoured fighting vehicles, the AMX-10RC. Now, other countries, including Germany and the US, have also promised to send infantry fighting vehicles or light tanks. But it's modern battle tanks, or heavy tanks, that President Zelensky is really fighting for. The UK has already announced that it will send 14 Challenger 2 battle tanks. But so far, the US has refused to commit the M1 Abrams, citing logistical and maintenance problems. The real pressure, though, is on Germany to donate its Leopard 2 tanks. Now, they are seen as the best suited hardware and the most widely available. Berlin's reluctance to do so means that other countries, like Poland, cannot then export their German-made Leopards onto Ukraine either. For more on all of this, we're going to bring in DW's chief political correspondent, Nina Hase, who's standing by for us at the uh, airbase in Rammstein. Hi there, Nina. Now, what we're hearing out of Rammstein so far is how vital it is for allies to act now. Is everyone close to being on the same page? Well, of course, that's the $100 billion question here. All eyes are on this meeting here at Rammstein. Uh, Lloyd Austin, the US Defense Secretary, said himself, Kiev's watching us, uh, the Kremlin is watching us, but history is also watching us. And of course, in the days leading up to this meeting, there was a lot of tension in the air. There was a lot of criticism of Germany's reluctance. Um, of course, the issue of battle tanks is one that is a big elephant in the room. Will Germany give its green light so that other countries can re-export the German-made uh, battle tanks to Ukraine, as they've suggested they want to do, like Poland, for example? Example. Um, but then, of course, uh, a lot of movement happening behind the scenes. And because it is such a crucial meeting, everybody is well aware of that. And uh, the feeling here is, of course, that they do have to deliver some tangible results, something that can really make a difference on the battlefield. What I thought was interesting also in the address by the um, Ukrainian president Zelensky was he didn't just ask for battle tanks. He also asked for U.S. systems like fighter jets, long-range missiles. He wants everything the West can give him. But of course, this meeting is also about coordinating which countries can deliver what best when. And they will have to de deliver some sort of a minimum result. I just want to talk about the issue of unity because, you know, all eyes are on Germany. The pressure is on uh, over this standoff over sending battle tanks to Ukraine. Could this German hesitancy that we're seeing push the unity of NATO, the unity of the European Union, to breaking point? 
Well, that is, of course, a huge yeah. test for Western unity. And, of course, everybody here, all the participants, are trying to avoid a situation where there is even the slimmest impression of a crack in that Western unity. They say that they remain resolved to support Ukraine for as long as it takes and that they want to sound convincing when they do that. But, of course, uh, Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor, has come under a lot of pressure, especially. Uh, the European Parliament passed a resolution saying uh, Germany needs to uh, stop standing on the brakes. Then there is the Tallinn Pledge, where some eight countries have um, outlined already what they are willing to deliver. And um, that includes Poland, that says it is willing to donate some of its Leopard 2 tanks that it got from Germany, where Germany, the German government, has to give its consent. Now, what I'm expecting to happen is that there is movement on that issue, that other countries will probably get this green light from the German government because there is no plausible explanation anymore for the German government not to do so. The German government argues, though, that they do need full US support. They need uh, the US to throw all its weight behind those efforts of uh, supplying Ukraine militarily as well. There's just this fear of potential escalation. And Olaf Scholz doesn't want Germany and the Europeans to stand alone in such a potential scenario. Now, Boris Pistorius, the new German defense minister, has already said that uh, nobody is ruling out the delivery of such Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine, but it needs to be deliberated very, very carefully. So, of course, the Western unity and Western resolve is being tested today. It is very rare. What today is definitely one of those moments where you as a journalist are aware that you're witnessing history in the making. And we will be watching closely. DW's chief political correspondent, Nina Haza, thank you. Now, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has made a point of increasing the pressure on Germany in an exclusive interview with German television. He used it to repeat his call for the rapid delivery of tanks. In plain language, can you deliver leopards or not? Then hand them over. It's not like we're attacking if anyone's worried about that. These leopards are not going to pass through Russia. We're defending ourselves. And we're going to talk now to Thomas Wiegold. He's a defence and security journalist here in Berlin. Welcome to DW. Now, we just heard there from President Hello. Zelensky the pressure on Germany to supply battle tanks. Explain for us, if you would, Olaf Scholz's hesitancy. Well, it's a bit difficult to explain. Uh, however, the impression, the overall impression is that the chancellor wants to avoid a symbolic dual situation. He doesn't want to see pictures of German tanks versus Russian tanks on the battlefield, which um, would uh, remain a reminder uh, the Russians, uh, the West, um, the world of the times past. I think that's his main concern, why he doesn't want to see uh, the, the tanks in this situation. On the other hand, Germany has delivered howitzers, has delivered rocket artillery. It's not that Germany would not have delivered lethal weapons. So it remains or it boils down to this symbolic picture. OK, so the shadow of German history, very apparent there. Now, Poland's deputy Definitely. foreign minister has said that it might send its German-made Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine without Germany's authorization. Can you tell us how significant that would be in terms of the EU and NATO? That would be rather significant. Uh, usually, when arms are exported from which country whatsoever, it comes with certain legal obligations. And from Germany, the obligation is before a country is allowed to re-export any weapons, they need approval by the original uh, country of production. And if Poland would skip this and would just say, we don't care, this would have legal obligations for the relations within the EU, within NATO, within Europe. There's so much talk about these Leopard 2 tanks that as the, the battle tank of choice, um, as opposed to the US Abraham. What, what makes them so, so special, so in demand? Well, first of all, um, it's a logistics problem. Um, the Abrams needs a lot more of 
either kerosene or diesel, depending on how it's used. But the, the fuel consumption is nearly double as high as with a leopard. And that's a problem on the stretched front lines in Ukraine. Logistics is a problem anyway. You have to get ammunition to the front line. You have to get fuel to the front line. And if you have to get the double amount of fuel, this puts a strain on all the logistics you can offer. So if the Leopard 2s were to make it to Ukraine, how decisive would they be in breaking through Russian lines? This would depend on the numbers the Europeans are willing and able to provide, and it would depend on the type. The Leopard comes uh, with the version 2 in, in a variety of types, from the 2A4 up to the 2A7. Uh, surely no country is willing to offer the most modern version, the 2A7+. Plus. So it will be either the 2A4 or the 2A5. And uh, which version it will be in the end will decide how useful, how um, effective these tanks will be against the Russian tanks. Thomas Vigo, defence and security journalist, thank you so much for that analysis. You're welcome. Earlier, I spoke to military expert and author Tim Ripley, who was based in London. I asked him if the German Leopard 2 tank, which President Zelensky desperately needs and is asking for, would make such a difference to the war. Uh, yes, I mean, the, at the moment, the, the, as, as your report showed, the Ukrainians are, are using their old equipment and it's taking a heavy, heavy battering. And we're just about to embark on a new season of fighting. The, the Russians have, have started uh, advancing around Bakhmut, uh, and that offensive is probably going to escalate very, very quickly. So this battle is going to soak up hundreds and hundreds of more uh, tanks and vehicles and artillery. Uh, the, the Ukrainians are going to take heavy losses, and they need replacements to, to, to come into the battle to keep the fight going. So, you know, we're, we're in January now, so this war is probably going to go on for, for many, many months. And uh, the losses the Ukrainians are going to take are going to be huge. So they need that replacement equipment from the West to, to feed in to keep the fight going. We hear uh, German Chancellor Scholz says he'll send Leopard 2 tanks only if the US sends Abrams tanks, which they say they won't. Has the German Chancellor found another way of stalling the decision? Well, I mean, this is, this is the sort of the famous, um, you know, um, it's, it's called the German war guilt thing, that they, they, they don't want to be seen to be uh, going to war with Russia by themselves. They want to be part of a NATO, an alliance uh, a manoeuvre, so they can't be accused of, of just it's being a, just a German war move. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a long-held German um, issue with, with supplying weapons to conflicts. Um, but, but, you know, the Americans have their own issues with supplying um arms and, and heavy equipment. Allegedly, um, President Biden made a, a deal with the Chinese back in, in, in this last spring that, that uh, to try and head off Chinese arms supplies, he promised the, 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 pre the president of China that America wouldn't supply offensive weapons, fighter planes, tanks, attack helicopters, long-range cruise missiles. So the, the Americans are calibrating their response as well. It's not just the Germans who have this uh, issue about not wanting to escalate the war too much. Right, and it's against that backdrop. Defence leaders will meet at the Ramstein Air Base today on, on Friday. US Secretary General Austin is hosting. Why do you think two of Ukraine's closest allies are finding it so hard to agree on what is needed here? And is there a solution to break the deadlock? Well, it, it's very clear that it, amongst the Western countries, there's no real clear consensus about how the war should end. I mean, Yes, I mean, every, everybody wants the Ukrainians to keep to be able to defend themselves, but no one is really clear about how the war ends. Is there a peace treaty? Do the Ukrainians keep fighting until they can recapture all their uh, lost territory, including Crimea? I mean, if you're talking about a Ukrainian offensive that retakes Crimea, um, that's probably going to end up with an endless war that will go on for years, and maybe even the Ukrainians won't be able to win it. Um, so it, 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 it's, it's, it's more a problem about how people see this war ending and, and the, the, the uncertainty about that, um, which is, is, is not going to be resolved very soon. Uh, and and that, is, that is why, you know, people are real, the, across the Western Alliance are reluctant to write a blank cheque to the Ukrainians to give them what they want at the moment.
Before we go, what do you think the Russian response would be if these tanks are delivered? Well, I think we're seeing the Russian response before the tanks are delivered. I mean, they've started their offensive now. On Tuesday, um, Defence Minister Soyo announced that the Russian army was going to form 12 new uh, motor rifle and parachute divisions ready to to be ready to attack. And they've already started employing their 300,000 reservists who they're mobilised in the autumn. So their attack is unfolding now and they're engaging their troops now. So they want to preempt the the uh, delivery of these 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 Western equipment, this even this first batch of Western equipment. They, they see their window of opportunity to attack right now. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, there's a famous phrase, the enemy has a vote. They are engaging in this battle to preempt the, the the Western deployment of arms to try and you know, get their position improved before these weapons arrive. So this war is dynamic and it's not going to be over very soon. I mean, there is talk about this being this delivery being decisive. It, it will make a difference. It will keep the Ukrainians fighting, but it's not going to end the war. Military and defence expert Tim Ripley, great to get your input. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And for more on this, our correspondent Sonia Falnica in Kyiv told us why these potential tank deliveries are so crucial to the Ukrainians. Well, Ukraine now has for months specifically been asking for these German-made Leopard tanks to be sent to the front line to help it recapture territory, but also to fend off new Russian advances. And there are experts here who do say these tanks will make a success, will make a difference on the battlefield because it will help Ukraine, you know, break through Russian defense positions and really end the kind of trench warfare that we're seeing in the eastern Donbas region that has inflicted heavy losses on both sides. So in that context, uh, President Zelensky has criticized Germany hesitancy on, on supplying these tanks. Um, and of course, the backdrop to all this is that concerns are growing in Ukraine, that it only has a short window now to prepare for an anticipated Russian offensive in the coming months. We don't know where that offensive might be. It could come from the east. Russian defense, uh, Ukrainian defense officials also saying it could potentially also come from the north, from Belarus. Lots of concerns there. So I think there is a growing sense of urgency here. Yesterday, the defense and foreign ministers of Ukraine put out a pretty strong statement saying that, you know, uh, the threat of a full-scale Russian offensive was very real, that Russia enjoys, still enjoys a, a significant advantage in terms of troops and equipment, and that Russia is determined to wage an active, um, active and long war. And that statement, you know, coincided with the arrival in Kiev yesterday of the president of the European Council, Charles Michel. Now, I I spoke to him yesterday here at a press briefing and he said that you know he remains in favor of providing these heavy battle tanks to Ukraine and insisted that the issue of these tanks will not really break European unity when it comes to supporting Ukraine and said you know uh, he was confident that a solution could be found. In terms of the war and the very bloody battles in the east of the country you referred to what's the latest we know? Well, there have been reports of renewed fighting in and around Bakhmut. This is a very key city where we've seen some of the bloodiest fighting in this war for months now. And there are, there are claims now by the Russian private mercenary group that they have taken over a village now, a small village southwest of Bakhmut. The Ukrainian military has not reacted to those claims. Um, this comes after, you know, Russia says it has also made advances in a, a northern, uh, in a salt mining town, Solidar, on the northern outskirts of Bakhmut. And I think all all this now adds up to a picture of, of you know, um, Ukraine's control of Bakhmut looking increasingly shaky. And Bakhmut, of course, is absolutely key. Russia has made it key to its campaign of, you know, pushing forward and occupying the entire Donbass region. So I think we're likely to see a lot of escalation there. Sonia Falnica in Kyiv, thanks so much.